All right, let's begin lesson 50. Wow, well, 50 lessons. This basically means if, if I'm going at about an hour a lesson, this has been a 50 hour course, which is way longer than any normal course would possibly be. So those of you who are learning general re relativity through my coursework are doing so in a particularly inefficient way, I got to say. On the other hand, um, the, the, the fact that we're unconstrained for time uh, gives us the opportunity to do all kinds of different things, like the proof of the wild, vial tensor, for example. And in fact, we're going to do more of that today. We're, so we are really like going deep into something that is either not mentioned at all in introductory general relativity or is mentioned quite passively, but it's a critical topic. Because, well, it's a critical topic for those who want to understand the subject of general relativity as a whole, because the vial tensor is uh, important for gravitational waves. It's, uh, it's an important to understand the details of how the Riemann tensor works, right? Uh, the Riemann tensor, of course, this is the, this is the important guy, or, but the vial tensor is a, a, a significant uh, a piece of it. So it's totally worth spending some time and getting comfortable with it. We've already shown how to derive the wild tensor through this presumption of conformal invariance, uh, whose significance, the significance of conformal invariance, we talked about actually in a previous lecture about uh, compactified coordinates. And we showed a conformally invariant metric associated with the uh, uh, Einstein uh, cosmological space-time. Let me, let me go back and check what lesson that was. Right, so way, way back in lesson six, I introduced the idea of conformally related coordinates at, I think, one hour and eight minutes. This is not one minute and eight seconds. It's one hour and eight minutes. Um, and then, so at the end of lesson six, I brought it up, but, and I promised to talk about it again, but I didn't get back to it till lesson 21, where the whole lesson was basically an example of how a conformally related metric uh, and two metrics that are conformally related, g hat equals e to the pi of x of g. If I have two metrics that are conformally related, the geodesics they describe are different except for light-like geodesics. Light-like geodesics are actually the same, and I went through that proof back in Lesson 21. So we've worked with conformally related metrics before. Uh, but the question of finding a tensor that's fundamental to the space-time that is invariant under this transformation, that's, that's the new subject we covered in the last lecture. But in this lecture, we're going to cover the fact that the vial tensor is traceless. So we're going to study the tracelessness. Um, wait, tracelessness. Yes, the characteristic of being traceless of the vial tensor, which is not... Uh, obviously related to the fact that it's conformally invariant. So we're going to go through this demonstration in this lesson. Okay, so let's begin. So what does tracelessness mean? Well, it means that the contraction, all the contractions are going to be zero. So the contraction on the first index, the contraction on the second index, and the contraction on the third index all will equal zero. So that is the tracelessness requirement for um, the vial tensor. And just as before, we are going to look for a decomposition of the Riemann tensor into a traceless piece and a part that has a trace. Now, what this means is that the entire trace of this is all from here. So we would write R, say, uh, alpha nu alpha beta equals R hat alpha nu alpha beta. And that's, of course, obvious because this equals zero. So the trace of this is definitely the sum of the two traces. And so this is ultimately the condition uh, we're after. The trace of the Riemann tensor equals just the trace of this part. So to begin this, we're going to use an observation that somebody discovered uh, while studying tensors that uh, we basically could have used in the last derivation, but we didn't. We are going to create this object called tensor A star, which is a 0, 4 rank tensor. And we're going to create it out of the metric and a uh, 0, 2 rank tensor A. And so for any 0, 2 rank tensor A, 
we can create this object, the 0, 4 rank tensor, by creating this structure here with the metric. Now notice what you're doing is you're creating a, four, uh, a rank 0, 4 tensor using some tensor and something that exists by presumption on this, on this space time, right? So we, we assume that we have this object G, and for any 0, 2 rank tensor, we can create this thing here, which we call A star. This object is an, a, uh, is an example of the use of something called the Kulkarni, the Kulkarni Nomizu, Nomizu product. And this happens a lot in the study of general relativity and, and actually in quantum field theory too. You end up with like a, an operation and they give it the name after like the first mathematicians or scientists who came up with it. And then all of a sudden everything quickly spirals out of control into a bunch of really esoteric language. So somebody might say, well, in order to prove the tracelessness of the vial tensor, first form the Kulkarni Numizu product of the Ricci tensor and the metric which is what we'll do in a moment. We'll substitute the Ricci tensor for A. But as soon as they say Kulkarni no Mitsu, as soon as they use this word, it's like, holy crap, what are they talking about? So that's always a problem with this subject is, is the use of esoteric language. Uh, well, first of all, language is only esoteric for those who are, well, language is always esoteric because the number of people who know what it means is relatively few. So no matter who you are, this is esoteric. But once you're one of the few who knows what it means, it's suddenly very easy. So in other words, esoteric does not equal hard, right? Right. Esoteric means known only by a few. Hard means it's a pain in the butt to learn. This is something that's, this, this name is known only by a few people like who study this stuff, but it's not very difficult to understand. But we should understand what the Kolkarni Nozimu product literally is in terms of our um, our standard method or my standard method of approaching tensors, which include basis vectors and uh, uh, lots of opportunities to use the non-coordinate basis notation, which won't have these indices. So what is the Kulkarni Nomizu product in uh, uh, coordinate free language? And then how does it translate into this expression here? So let's let's have a look at that. So in coordinate free notation, this is the definition of the Kolkarni no Mizu product. The symbol is like the wedge symbol from uh, from our from the uh, our, our material about differential forms, the wedge operator. But you put a circle around it, and then all of a sudden it's the Kolkarni no Mizu product. And I do not think that's standard notation. This is sufficiently rarely used that it's probably not standard. But the point is, is that this is the definition of it. This object here, obviously, it's we know that it is a 0, 4 tensor because it's gobbling up four vectors. So we're going to assume that these four objects are vectors, right? And this object, therefore, must be a 0, 4 tensor because it eats four vectors. And this whole side here, of course, is a real number, right? So it's a 0, 4 tensor that gobbles up four vectors and gives a real number. So what number does it give? Well, if for this to be a 0, 4 tensor, part of the definition is that A and B have to both be 0, 2 tensors, right? 0, 2 tensors. They can't be 0, 3 and, and, and a vector or a vector in 0, 3. It's got to be two 0, 2 tensors. So the Kolkarni no Mizu product, as we're studying it, is a very specific object. It takes two 0, 2 tensors, produces a 0, 4 tensor. And the definition of the 0, 4 tensor is defined through this operation here, where A, which is a 0, 2 tensor, gobbles up W and Y, and B gobbles up X and Z. Those two given, that's a real number, right? Uh, this is a real number, and that's a real number. You multiply those two together, and then this whole first term is a real number. And then you do that again, but this time it's X and Z, and W and Y, and then you take this real number and you subtract it, and this real number, and you subtract it. And when you get this, this whole when you get this done, this whole thing is uh, is a real number, which is exactly what a four, zero four tensor does. So the Carnino Mizu product is just this definition. 
uh, is defined this way. And what's nice about the Kolkarni Nomitsu product is when A and B are both symmetric, right? When A and B are both symmetric, then the symmetries of this object are exactly the symmetries of the Riemann tensor. And observing this just sort of simplifies this process that we did in the last lecture from scratch, where we just presumed a form for the, for the object and forced the symmetries. Now we take something that already has the symmetries built in. It's essentially, it's the equivalent process. But um, regardless, uh, this tensor here will have some uh, all the symmetries we need. And what do we mean by that? Well, what are the components of this tensor? Well, I'll write them down. First, I take the, uh, the Kolkarni Nomitsu product and I act on the basis vectors, right? This is going to give me a real number. Well, what real number is that going to give me? Well, it's going to give me uh, the, the 0, 1, 2, 3. It's going to basis vector or a component of the tensor itself. So it's going to give me um, uh, a star 0, 1, 2, 3, right? And likewise, if I did this in a more general way, and I went E mu, E nu, E alpha, E beta, I would end up with A star mu nu alpha beta. That's how, that's how you go from the coordinate free language into the uh, coordinate, um, the, uh, coordinate basis, right? Or you choose a basis and you go into the uh, coordinate based language. But if, if you, and you can check, but you will discover right away that A alpha, um, well, A star, I'm sorry, A star um, mu nu alpha beta equals minus A star mu nu beta alpha. And you'll notice that A star mu, oops, uh, mu nu alpha beta anti-symmetrized, that it's all going to equal zero. And you will notice that uh, if you swap the first two, you also get a negative sign like this. And if you swap these two with these two, you get no negative sign, right? So all the symmetries of the Riemann tensor exist in, the, uh, in this product. And then we can also take, as an example, all, well, wait a minute, let me make it clear. All the symmetries of the Riemann tensor exist with the with the Kolkarni Nomizu product if A and B are both symmetric, right? These two have to be symmetric, right? And so what, what is the most obvious uh, product that we can make on a given space-time? And that's the Kolkarni Nomizu product of G with itself, of the metric with itself, because you're guaranteed to have this metric, right? You're guaranteed to have it. And they're both symmetric, so that's cool. But so, what is this thing going to be? So this thing, that's in the coordinate free form, but we would write it in the coordinate, in the coordinate form is g mu nu alpha beta, and it's going to end up being two times g mu alpha g nu beta minus g mu beta g nu alpha. And the reason you don't have four terms is because if you if you do this sort of degenerate product right with g with itself you can see that some of these things are plus the symmetry that these two terms are going to be the same right um because a and b are the same so axy bwz and awz bxy those two are going to combine together and these two are going to combine together as well so that's where the factor of two comes out when you do the product of a of a symmetric tensor with itself so um, so this is a guaranteed tensor that you can create, and it will share all the symmetries of the Riemann tensor. So, uh, but the other one that we want to make is, of course, going to be uh, the, the uh, is going to be the Kolkarni no Mitsu product of R with G. And that we're going to define as R star. Actually, that's a good point. When I come up here, notice that my definition of A star up here, 
um, was G was involved, right? So when I write A star, I'm actually thinking of the Kolkino, Kolkarni Mitsu product of the 0 2 rank tensor called A with the metric, right? That's what A star is. The Kolkarni Mitsu product is a general expression of any two 0 2 rank tensors. When B is chosen to be the metric, that's when the star applies in the way I'm defining things. So uh, when I wrote this down here, that's really not that's really not right because my star would only apply the way I'm doing it if B is the metric, right? So I would have to have some other sort of symbol like maybe a dagger or something, right? A little dagger here because here I'm actually no, I would have to have something indicating A and B. So maybe I would put A to the B power or, you know, it would just something to indicate I have A and B. But the star is reserved for when B is equal to the metric, all right? And this is all just definitional stuff, right? It's just, I'm sure this, there's, I haven't seen enough of this to know if there's a real good standard for it. But uh, anyway, R star is implied this Kolkarni Nomitsu product. But, um, uh, Okay, so this is going to be R star. So we'll have R star um, uh, mu, nu, alpha, beta. And then, of course, it's dx mu tensor product, dx nu tensor product, dx alpha tensor product, dx beta, just like that. All right, so this is the uh, uh, coordinate free form, and this is the coordinate basis form of R star. And so now I'm going to make the following presumption that the Riemann tensor itself can be broken down into the Weyl tensor and then it needs to be this part R hat, right? This is the part we called R hat uh, mu nu alpha beta. And just like in the last lecture, we're going to assume that R hat is constructed from the Ricci tensor and the uh, Riemann scalar, actually, I've seen that called the Ricci scalar. I don't know why I've been avoiding it. But this side has to have all of the symmetries of the metric. Um, in the previous version of this, we this was sort of called W, and we assumed it had those symmetries. And uh, this part, we broke down into the Ricci tensor in all of its forms. But what we've really done is compressed all of those forms inside our notation for, for, uh, for this guy, for, through, through the product, right? So all of those forms are actually going to be in there, but they're going to be multiplied by uh, the metric, right? So the metric is already sort of in place here, and the metric is already in place here. So this side is always a factor of the Ricci tensor and the metric and the Ricci scalar and the metric. But the symmetries are already constructed by definition using uh, using this using this product that we invented earlier that has all those symmetries, and you can check, right? So, um, uh, so down down here where I write uh, this, oops, where I wrote this. Maybe I should blow that up a little better. I should write that a little better. So this expression here actually equals this. And you'll notice that, you know, before we had tensor A in the previous lecture, we had tensor A, tensor B, tensor H, tensor G. And when we solved it, we ended up with a metric 1 over N and a minus or a plus sign, right? We and we're, we're, that's already kind of pre-built in here because we're making the assumption from the start that this guy is part of the decomposition. And the reason we're making the assumption is that's the simplest way to create the required symmetries using just the Ricci tensor and the metric. So we, in advance of this whole thing, we use the symmetry to take us as far as we can. And that's actually pretty far. We had to solve for every single expression in the previous exercise. But here we, we, we're, we're very comfortable with the fact that the right-hand side has to A, have the same symmetries as the left, but also the right-hand side can only be constructed out of G, R, and, uh, and the scalar R. 
And so we know this has all those symmetries. So this is actually quite equivalent to what we did before, but we're really starting more advanced instead of writing it, uh, instead of writing a nu beta r mu alpha for this first term, and then solving for a and discovering it equals one over n minus, I think it was n minus two g uh, nu beta, right? Instead of discovering this, we start with that assumption because that's really the only way it can be. So, uh, so we start from a different place. I just thought it would be more interesting to, 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 to take that approach. This is the approach where the symmetry is the dominant thing. Okay, but anyway, so the symmetry of this term and this term are the same. Now we're looking for these real numbers, gamma and nu, or gamma and eta, gamma and eta. So the first step is simple. We are going to f first form the uh, contraction that we want. Right, we want to get the alpha contracting with alpha. We already know that if if this guy shares the symmetries we expect, then that's really the only contraction. So if this contraction zero, the contraction with beta will be zero, and we already know by definition the contraction with um, alpha over nu. If we had contracted that way on the first indice, first two indices, that would be zero. So all we have to do is check this one. So here I've done it. I've made that contraction. Here now R. Um, our star, uh, ignore, ignore this for a moment, go back to this first part, our star, we just raise mu and we contract that way, and g star, we raise alpha, we raise mu to get alpha contracting. So this expression has to be zero. So now we just calculate this, and we calculate that, and we find the values of gamma and eta that will make it all zero. So we want to start by creating this guy right here, r star. We want to create r star alpha nu alpha beta. So let's look at let's look at um, let's look at this. Here's r star with the all lower indices. So I want to raise mu. I want to raise mu and make it alpha. So I want to multiply. I want to multiply this by g alpha mu. If I multiply that by g alpha mu, then this guy will end up equaling r star alpha mu alpha beta, which is exactly what I'm after. So I have to multiply both sides by g alpha mu. So if I multiply this by g alpha mu, I end up raising this and... Uh, I end up raising that and get r up alpha, down alpha, g mu nu. So let me put that term in context, right? So uh, um, I've, uh, I've raised, well, first of all, this contraction here is just r mu beta. That's the definition of the Ricci tensor, right? It's the, the Riemann tensor uh, contracted over the first and uh, third indices. So that is r nu beta. Then it's minus gamma, and then it's this thing, and this thing is here, and now I looked at the first term. The first term is to raise mu, and you get r alpha alpha g mu nu. Okay, so now we look at the second term of this part, which is this part. So now I have g alpha mu on this thing, and that raises this guy up to be alpha. So I'm going to write that it's a minus sign. Uh, no, is it a minus sign? Yeah, no, it's a plus sign. The minus sign is here, so that's a plus sign. So it's going to be uh, R nu beta G alpha alpha, like that. And then the next one is, why is it a minus? It should, should be a plus sign, plus sign there. And then um, now it's a minus, minus, um, Oh, and these minus signs are killing me. All right, let me get these minus signs straight. So this definition of, of C has the Riemann tensor minus gamma minus nu, and those negative signs flowed from, uh, from yeah, from here. So it's R is this plus this, so it's C is, is R minus that. 
but I've decided that um, our hat is gamma, the gamma piece plus, yeah, so, yeah, so the Riemann tensor is the uh, vial tensor plus gamma times this, uh, times this product form of the Ricci scalar plus eta times that. So I, re I realign this and I get minus signs there and there. This is a positive, positive, negative, negative. So minus a positive, minus a positive. So now I need this to be a negative sign. Phew, okay. So the uh, third part of the third part of this term here is now g alpha mu raising this guy. So that's going to be, um, uh, so I multiply by g, oops, I'm doing that in blue for, for demonstratives, g uh, alpha mu, which has the effect of raising that guy to being an alpha. And so we should get now a minus um, r up alpha down beta g nu alpha. And likewise, the last term should be a minus r uh, nu alpha g alpha beta. Okay, like that. And then and then uh, I repeat this exercise. Now I'm going to raise these indices here. So I'm going to get minus eta r. And then that substitution is going to go back to this expression here. Right? We're going to use that expression for this substitution. So it's 2 times g mu alpha nu beta. So I guess I have a factor of 2 here. 2 g mu alpha g nu beta minus, and then it's uh, mu beta nu alpha. g, really? Mu alpha nu beta, mu beta nu alpha. Mu beta nu alpha. And now these guys have to, I have to do the same thing. I have to raise the index I'll um, raise the mu index to be alpha, and so this one becomes alpha alpha, and this one becomes alpha uh, beta. Okay, I, I did this out the long way just to show you sort of the, the exercise that we're kind of going through here. So in principle, how should this all wash out? Well, let's look at this. R alpha alpha, we know what that is. That's just the Riemann, uh, the, the uh, Ricci scalar. That's just the curvature, right? That's the definition of the curvature is, is R alpha alpha equals this curvature. So that's R. So that's easy. Um, G alpha alpha, that's easy too, right? That is the uh, dimension of the spacetime. That's just N, the number of dimensions in the spacetime. Um, R, R up alpha down beta G mu nu, that can't be simplified. And uh, this, however, can be simplified because G up alpha down beta, that is simply delta alpha beta, right? And delta alpha beta means this alpha is going to become a beta. So that whole term becomes R nu beta and everything's gone. Um, here, this becomes n for the space-time, right? So that goes away. And then this becomes delta alpha beta uh, because uh, the upper and lower uh, indices are... It's, it's, in, it's the inverse relationship, right? G, um, G, A, B, G, B, C equals delta A, C. That's sort of a rule you've got to remember because... Uh, these these are two these are inverse uh, have an inverse relationship. Okay, so that's a lot of simplification we can do, and here again you see the n's popping in and everything is popping in. So let me rewrite this. And if I did everything correctly, which will 
we'll know when this all shakes out. <laughs> um, I get the this thing equals the Ricci scalar. Actually, what is this thing? I better keep track of what's supposed to be on the left side. This is supposed to be C alpha um, nu alpha beta. So first of all, notice that alpha alpha cancels. I better end up, everything over here better end up um, as a 0 to tensor. But I have nu beta over here. This ends up being the nu beta Ricci uh, tensor. That's, that was easy. And then uh, we have R, a constant, nu beta, N times R, the Ricci tensor. The same Ricci tensor is here, by the way. Um, and then uh, we have this term, which is sort of a mixed Ricci tensor and the metric. And then here we have the Ricci tensor yet again, right? Um, that's the one, that last one is the one that happened from this delta function. And again, we have this delta function here where this alpha and beta come together. So this alpha here is going to change to a beta, which is what we have right there, that beta. And then uh, the n pops up again. That's the same n from this g alpha alpha contraction. So now we can simplify this thing, right? Ultimately, this had better equal zero, right? This had better equal zero. So let's see how it goes. What's the next step? So let's see, I think I combined this correctly. I want to get all the factors of the Ricci scalar uh, nu beta out front. So there's a factor of 1, and then here's a factor of minus gamma n, minus gamma n, and then here's a factor of minus, uh, minus gamma n, oh, and here's a factor of minus plus, plus gamma r nu beta, right, uh, minus gamma r nu beta. Then there's this thing. Well, the thing I forgot to do is, well, this is g nu alpha, and this is r alpha beta, where alpha is up. So this is actually going to lower the alpha index into nu, right? So this guy here is actually going to be r nu beta. So this ends up being minus 2 r nu beta right there, because this is just lowering the index alpha, right? That's all it's doing. It's a little index gymnastics. So that 2 combines with this gamma to give us plus, and then the minus sign, so it's plus 2 gamma. So we have that is all the factors of R nu beta. Then I'm looking for all the factors of R uh, g nu beta. And that's this one here, which is minus gamma. And then I have minus 2 R um, or minus 2 r eta n g nu beta. So if I take r out, I get minus 2 eta n, minus 2 eta n. And then I have this 2 eta, which is just, uh, well, 2 r, yeah, two, this is 2 r eta g mu nu, 2 eta r g mu nu. So this is, I think this is correct, the minus sign, the minus sign, that's a plus sign. Okay. So this whole thing here has got to equal zero. Well, it's only going to equal zero if I choose the right gamma and the right eta. And what are those choices going to be? Well, I need one minus gamma n plus two gamma equals zero. The first term has to be zero. So that factor has to be zero because this, of course, could be anything. And if I solve this, what do I get? I think I get this. I get 1 minus gamma over 2 minus n. That's plus, that's a, no, it's 1, it's 1 uh, plus gamma over 2 minus n, and then that equals minus 1 over 2 minus n, which is 1 over n minus 2. Yeah, so this is right. And then uh, eta has to be, has to come from minus gamma minus 2 eta n plus 2 eta equals 0, right? We got to get we got to get this factor to equal 0 now. So both terms, this term and this term will be 0. So to get that factor to use 0, I need to solve this equation. And let's see if I can do that real quick. And uh, it took me a second, but uh, this is what you end up with for eta. Eta equals minus 1 over 2, n minus 2, n minus 1, uh, just by, you know, factoring things out and just doing a little bit of algebra, and then substituting in your solution here for 
gamma. So you end up with this guy. So now I know what eta and gamma is. And once I know eta and gamma, I mean, the whole thing is, is done, right? Because, oops, because that is, that goes right into here, right? And then, then or better yet, goes right into here and it solves for C. And so we can just do that. We can just plug it all in. And what do we end up with? And this is what you get. It's pretty straightforward. I'm just substituting in gamma here. And I'm substituting in eta here. And eta comes in with a minus sign, so that becomes a plus, right? Because our original definition had a minus gamma and a minus eta. But eta itself is negative, so you end up with the plus. This g star, this g star is actually this expression here times a factor of 2, which is nice because that factor of 2 will cancel here, leaving behind just this piece. And if you look at the last lecture, that's exactly the piece we had left over. This guy comes in, once you make this substitution, right, once you make the substitution, this substitution here, this R, just the black stuff, just the black part, once you make that substitution, you'll see that this matches all of the A, B, H's, and D's exactly like it did in the last lecture, except these two come in as a different sign than these two, but that's taken care of by that negative sign there. So this is exactly the same answer that we got last time. And as far as I can tell, that's not trivial. The fact that this thing, so this guy here, once I raise mu, if I, if I raise mu and convert it to alpha and take its trace, this guy will end up tracing out to zero. These n minus two pieces and this and this will all add up to, and subtracted from that will all end up being zero. And um, uh, that's not trivial that this traceless analysis and the conformal invariance analysis are the same. And I'd like to actually spend some time untangling that. Um, it's something that when I prepared this lecture, uh, I thought, oh, I'm going to derive the, re the uh, vial tensor a little more thoroughly than in most books, just to give my lectures a little extra value. But then I realized there's these two methods, and I'm not quite sure I get why the tracelessness and the conformal invariance gives you the same answer. There's got to be a deep reason for it, and I'm sure there's like a million people who are experts in this subject who immediately know the answer. Um, the thing about general relativity is you're always sort of an expert at what you're doing. You know, this whole idea of like conformal invariance and the fact that um, uh, f conformal invariance uh, uh, leads to, say, geodesics, like, like geodesics that have the same path and all of the geodesic equation calculations, nobody's ever an expert at it all at one time. It's like you become really good at it, move on to something else, and then you've got to go relearn everything you've learned before. So, you know, I've learned about the vial tensor for a long, long time, but I never really considered it quite this deeply uh, to ask the question is, why is this traceless calculation the same as the conformal invariance calculation? So we're going to do a diversion and get to the bottom of that. It's really interesting. We're going to have to discuss two, uh, something called Riemann normal co coordinates, Riemann normal coordinates, um, which are good because it'll give us an example of using uh, coordinates. It'll give us an example of using some new coordinate transformations and an uh, interesting coordinate system, which is always good to practice with. And hopefully by getting into the Riemann normal coordinates, we'll get a little bit of a hint of, how, of what's up with the wild tensor tracelessness and conformal invariance. Okay, so that's all for this lesson and we'll see you next time.